Here we are at Pontefract Castle, which was one of the most important castles in medieval England. It was the site of many significant historical events and is linked to many more. Today, it's a mere shadow of its former self. To truly appreciate it and its history, you've got to use your imagination. This is what I'm going to try and help you do in this video. It was built in 1070 as a wooden Motton Bailey castle by Ilbert de Lacey on land granted to him by William the Conqueror. Its strategic location near the Great North Road and an important crossing point of the River Eyre led to it being nicknamed the Key to the North by Edward I. The crossing point of the River Eyre is over there near the remaining cooling towers of Ferrybridge Power Station. This is the old bridge at Ferry Bridge that was completed in 1808. An earlier bridge over the River Eyre would have been located in this general area during the period of the castle's heyday. We're now going to look at some of the stone elements of the castle. First up is St Clement's Chapel, which was built around 1080 and served as the private chapel of the de Lacey family. It was the first part of the castle to be built in stone. We're now looking at the keep, which was also called the Round Tower. This was in place as a stone structure by around 1244 and as a sort of quatrefoil shape, which means that it was shaped like a four-leafed clover. Its unique shape was probably inspired by castles in the Holy Land observed during the Crusades. Construction in stone continued over the course of the 12th century. Its high walls with foundations built on solid rock made it one of the strongest castles in England. The nature of its foundation served it well throughout its history by making mining of the walls frustratingly difficult. In the early 14th century, the castle's owner, Thomas, Earl of Lancaster, got on the wrong side of King Edward II, and some believe that he had been hanging around with Robin Hood. Thomas, Earl of Lancaster, became Lord of the castle in 1311 when he married Alice de Lacey. Unfortunately for him, he mounted an unsuccessful rebellion against King Edward II. In 1332, he was imprisoned in his own castle prior to his execution in March of that year. Nevertheless, he was admired locally as a defender of popular liberties, and the site of his death was revered and became a site of holy miracles and a focus for pilgrimage. An interesting side note of this story that is significant in English folklore is that he was supported in his rebellion by a certain Robert Hode of Wakefield, who subsequently hid in surrounding forests as an outlaw. This, of course, to many people, links him to the legend of Robin Hood. Once the castle had been built in stone, that was not the end of its development. Like many buildings, it was repaired, refined and extended at various times in its history. The Swillington Tower is a noteworthy example of such extension. What makes this feature especially interesting is that it was built outside the main walls and connected to the curtain wall via some kind of bridge. This projection of the fortification would have probably aided defensive operations by allowing them to direct ranged weapons onto the flanks of attacking forces. The tower, originally called the New Tower, may have subsequently been named after Sir Robert Swillington, who was the steward of the castle under John of Gaunt. If it was indeed built at the time of Swillington, it probably dates back to the latter part of the 14th century. I'll now talk about the use of the castle as a prison, and in particular, the imprisonment of King Richard II. The castle's dungeons are located under the grassed area of the Inner Bailey. They are cut into the rock on which the castle stands. I did not manage to find the entrance to the dungeons on my trip to the castle. However, there must be an obvious way in as regular tours are organised from time to time when people can get an idea about the conditions that prisoners had to endure. The area that I refer to as the dungeons were also used as a powder magazine to store gunpowder. Quite a few important political prisoners were kept at the castle. Richard II was kept at the castle after he was deposed by Henry Bolingbroke, the future King Henry IV, in 1399. He is thought to have died in the Gascoigne Tower under suspicious circumstances in 1400. The constable of the castle during Richard II's time there was Sir Robert Waterton, who was an ancestor of the locally famous explorer and environmentalist Charles Waterton of the village of Walton. Waterton, as constable, would have had his lodgings adjacent to the constable tower. These are the remains of the constable tower 
that you can see on your walk up to the castle from the car park. The whole affair surrounding the death of Richard II was dramatised by Shakespeare in his tragedy of the same name. We're now going to explore some more parts of the castle, but in the context of Tudor times. There were some very significant historical events that took place at the castle during this period, and we'll now consider some of these. This is the location of the castle's main gate and Barbican. On the 19th of October 1536, tens of thousands of rebels, led by Robert Ask and Thomas Maunsell, appeared outside the castle walls. The rebellion is known to history as the Pilgrimage of Grace. The following day, the castle's guardian, Lord Darcy, and his vastly outnumbered garrison allowed them through the gates without a fight. The Pilgrimage of Grace was a rebellion against Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries. The Tudors had a reputation for lavish entertainment and sumptuous banquets. The castle will have hosted such celebrations, especially when a royal progress was lodged at the castle. This is the context that we will use while exploring the next castle locations. What we are looking at now are the ruins of the royal apartments, where the monarch would have been lodged and entertained. This part is the wall of the Great Hall, where the monarch would have held court and presided over the entertainment. Behind it would have stood the Queen's Tower to the left and the King's Tower to the right. Presumably the towers would have served as the royal living accommodation. I presume some of the other towers around the castle may have been used for guest accommodation. To the right of the King's Tower are the remains of the Elizabethan Chapel. This is what we are looking at now. In 1541, while at the castle as part of a royal progress, Henry VIII's fifth wife, Catherine Howard is thought to have committed adultery with Thomas Culpepper. It was this act that led her to being accused of treason and executed. Mary Queen of Scots also stayed in the castle, presumably in the royal apartments, on the 28th of January 1569. What we are looking at now is the Great Kitchen. During Tudor entertainment and royal progresses, it will have been a beehive of activity and purpose. It had four fireplaces, though today all that remains is the pink staining on the wall created by the heat as the fires blazed. Next door is the bakehouse, which had two ovens that were used for baking bread. These are what we are looking at now. Their circular remains are easy to make out in the now ruined castle. Still on the theme of Tudor entertainment, we are now looking at what I think is the brew house. This is located right next to the bakehouse. I guess the cereal grains used to make bread would also be the basic ingredient of ale too. During the English Civil War, the castle was the base of operations for Royalist forces. From the castle, they were able to mount guerrilla raids into the surrounding hostile Yorkshire countryside. A series of sieges took place from late 1644, during the first siege, the Piper Tower next to the keep was systematically destroyed by roundhead artillery bombardment. The Royalists resisted valiantly until they were on the brink of starvation. In the end, on the 21st of July 1645, and following negotiations, they were allowed to honourably leave the castle fully armed to rejoin the Royalist forces. The Royalists retook the castle in 1648, and Pontefract was the last Royalist stronghold to fall to Parliament. Oliver Cromwell himself was in charge of the besieging forces at one point. After it finally fell for the last time, the castle was demolished to its present condition. Parliament gave the order on the 27th of March 1649. It was done with the full support of the townsfolk of Pontefract, who were fed up with the hassles associated with living near a castle. Today, Pontefract Castle is a romantic ruin and a backdrop for leisure, historical education and family outings. We end our historical tour of Pontefract Castle here at the Herb Garden. This is a nod to the growing of licorice in the castle for the manufacture of Pontefract or Pomfret cakes for which the area is famed. <laughs>